Hello there, welcome to this week's episode of Lifestyle Pirates with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. G'day. It has been a while since we've been front and centre on the screen here. You can thank the big C, and I'm not talking about Chardonnay, I'm talking about COVID. I thought you were talking about me. Well, that as well. <laughs> uh, we've had a few guests that uh, we've had to kind of reschedule, but it is very, very good to be back. We have had this week's guest in the pipeline for quite some time. I listened to a few podcasts with him on, I've listened to his TED Talk, and it is an absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce Tom Nash, DJ quadruple amputee and keynote speaker Forbes bottom 40 under 40 welcome Tom thank you very much for having me and thanks for the invitation today Mate, no worries. it's been a pleasure yeah. um I mean yeah we were supposed to do this a few a few months ago now that's um, right you returned from Dubai your your partner had COVID yeah. then you had COVID yeah, that's right <laughs> um, a series of COVID mm, events it, it seems like the new norm nowadays yes I don't, I don't like the word the words the new normal mm. I don't like the uh, we're going to have to learn to live with it. Yeah. You know, and it's not that I, I don't agree with those things. It's just that whenever I hear people spout things that are like on the news all the time, like what if I complain about COVID yeah. and then someone's like, we're just going to have to learn to live. I'm like, shut the fuck yeah, up. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's verbatim. Where did you hear that? SBS, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. <laughs> well, mate, you're one, get, you're one ahead of me because I've stopped watching the news. I, yeah, I, really? I, I might read it I don't know, a couple of times a week, but okay. otherwise it Read it. Be, yeah, on Ooh, the paper. Sometimes I buy a newspaper, just sit out there on a Sunday morning, or I might look at the website. But used to watch it in the mornings, and and just don't do it anymore. I mean, Can I ask you a question? Actually, on that, ha- has your experience of what you think is going on in the world changed? Like, can you? Uh, there's a guy who had a theory. It was a quite interesting one. I forget who it was. Maybe Cialdini or something. Who said that you know, if you start to watch the news in weekly formats, as in you only sort of log in once a week or, or read the bigger, like if you read the Atlantic or something, mm. you know, whatever, the New Yorker, once a month mm. or once a week, you have a very different view of what's going on in the world than if you log in every day and read the you know f- yeah. uh, fear mongering headlines yeah. or the clickbait titles. Because those things that sort of summarise what has happened over the month kind of weeds out all the clickbaity shit and then just gives you the important stuff yeah. that's happened. Have, so have you noticed a difference in the way that you see things viewing media differently? Yeah, I think I pay attention a lot more. So if I read it a couple of times a week, I actually read the articles rather than the headline. Whereas right. when I used to check it out every day, it would just be the headline and you'd you'd almost make the rest up. Mm. Um, See, so yeah, I think it probably has changed. And even watching it, you know, I, I find that... The morning stuff used to rile me up and you'd walk to work and all, all, all kind of angst and, and, and anxious. Yeah. Um, for no real reason at all. Uh, and now we'd have Cafe Del Mar in the morning and have a coffee. And then in the evening, it's a nice kind of come down. So you don't get the stress that yeah. you normally would. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing that I've, I've noticed about the news recently, and I only, sorry, noticed this recently, but it's probably been happening, mm. you know, indefinitely, um, is that... Everybody talks about media bias and news bias yeah. in the way that's kind of, well, we always know Fox News is a bit right. We always know CNN is a bit left, you know, whatever it is. And sure, that's true. Yeah. But one of the most interesting discoveries that I made was that the bias that's that you can't see in the news isn't how they talk about something, but it's what they talk about. Mm. So if you log on to, you know, MSNBC, CNN, ABC, all this, and they're all talking about the same thing, you'd naturally think that thing is more important. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean yeah. by that? Mm-hmm. So, so your bias towards deciding what is important that's happening in the world is based on what they're talking about, yeah. not h- how they're talking about yeah. it. Or what they're not talking about. Or what they're not talking yeah. about. Yeah, what's unimportant or yeah. you know, whatever it is. And that's an interesting bias that I don't think anyone really picks up on. You know, we just watch all these different news channels and we're kind of like, yeah, we understand they're a bit left or a bit right or a bit yeah, libertarian yeah. or a bit you know, anarchist or whatever it is. But you're not really realising that the content that you're actually seeing is informing how important that you think certain issues are. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, totally. I see I've, uh, I haven't watched the news for a very long time and during the week I sort of delete my social media as well. Yeah. So delete. And, yeah. I, I, well, I deleted the app off my phone. So, oh, okay, so yeah. during the week, so I can't log into it. And that, just, that, that's really interesting. Do yeah. you find you use something? I did this trick uh, a couple of years mm. ago and I, I felt like such an idiot when I did it. I was like, I'm, looking at Instagram too much. Yeah. I'm looking at Facebook too much. Like, how do I fix this? And I didn't want to delete it because I use it for work and, you know, promote stuff like that. So I use this little trick on myself and I just, I put it on like the second page and I nested it in two folders. Yeah. So it was really hard to get to. Yeah. And then I looked at my screen usage time and it went down by like 75%. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, how can I be that fooled 
But yeah. ju- you know, just because it's hard to get to. It's <laughs> funny like, you say so that. I did I'm the lazier same thing. Than I am. So yeah. at the bottom bar where you can have your your hot yeah. hot things on um on iPhone. I moved my um my Instagram from there and I put my emails. Mm. And then, but then I started fucking going in my emails too much. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, at, I'm just about to go to sleep and I, lo- I go into my emails because I work at a company that's overseas. Yeah. Um, you know, th- that's the time that they're active. So mm. then I found myself just about to go to sleep and then I see like 15 emails come through and then I'm wired. So then I'm like, oh, fuck, now yep. I've got to get rid of that. You never respond to my emails. I didn't, even know, I didn't even know you had a computer. <laughs> He's got a filter for yours. Yeah. Don't yeah. ask questions yeah, you don't rules. want to get the answer yeah. to. Rules, like, automatic, automatic <laughs> junk. Yeah, but right isn't, it, isn't it crazy to think that we we can even fool ourselves? Mm. Like just the design of our phone, yeah. how the icons are laid out, changes our behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you ever hear a guy called Dan Ariely? He's a, a, a behavioral scientist. Okay. Brilliant guy. I, I met him once and I, I had a, an affinity with him because he'd been burnt as a child mm. and he used to talk about uh, in one of his uh, I think maybe a TED talk that he did was about how he went back and studied um, the science of ripping off band-aids faster mm. or slower yeah because I, I went through having you know so many scars on my body and um, you know all sorts of skin damage yeah. and having dressings every day and they would rip bandages off really quickly and I would contend I'd be like mm. please do it slower even though that's uh, you know contrary to the wisdom of the mm. day you know rip the band-aid off fast it's a trope you know yeah yeah um and he went and he actually found out that it was less painful overall to rip a band-aid off slower because there was no spike mm. in in the pain it was a, a longer elongated sort of constant style yeah. pain and that that's what got me into him i went to uh, see him speak up at the masonic uh, center i think in sydney like five years ago or something and i met him afterwards had a great chat with him he's a fantastically interesting guy mm. And he once deployed, a, I think, a, a research paper about, um, is it uh, organ donors in Europe, right? And they would have several different countries and they would say, how many, what's the percentage of drivers that donate organs? And I don't remember the exact statistics, but for example, it'd be something like, you know, France and Germany, it'd be 11% and 12%. And then something like, you know, Norway would be 13%, but Sweden was 87%. They, they couldn't really work out. It's quite anomalous, right? Because mm. you'd think the first thing that you'd think would be, well, maybe there's something cultural mm. ab- about these countries that they don't like to donate organs or maybe it's financial. But you'd have a lot of countries that were socioeconomically similar or culturally yeah. similar that would donate in a completely different fashion, you know, yeah. 90% to 10%, some yeah. crazy like that. Mm. And what they worked out was what set the countries apart was the design of the form when you actually applied for your license, right? So in the countries that people uh, donated their organs, it would say, tick this box if you do not want to be Mm. part of the organ donor program. Mm. And then in the countries that donated little, it would be like, tick this box if you would like to be part of the organ donor program. So what he contended was that when, when decisions that human beings have to make are seemingly complicated, we would rather the, de- the decision to be made for us. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we accept the default. So, <laughs> so simply opting in or opting out, most people just don't opt into things if it's a difficult decision. Yeah. And so they flipped all of the forms of the applications and all of the statistics of organ donors went up in all of those countries. That's crazy. Eh? So the person who designed that form... Who, who just maybe one or two words had, had the effect of probably saving, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives. Yeah, I know, right? Crazy. What, you mentioned um, drivers. Why was it just not oh, the I general mean, public? I, I don't know if it was drivers. Oh, or okay, gen- right. I assume that it's, driver, yeah. you know, when you become a, an organ donor, yeah, three year driver's a, license, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I think it was it that, yeah. Mm. Fair enough, okay. That's amazing. Just because it's difficult, you'd rather someone making a decision for us. That's like trying to choose a restaurant with your missus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of like, man, can you just fucking choose? There's, there's, like, there's a distinct yeah. level of self-preservation in that as well, though, <laughs> yeah. I would contend, yeah. Actually, you mentioned that. So I have food. it. I have it. Yeah, food. <laughs> I'm Because I'm quite a visual person. Mm. I'll tend to look at the pictures on Instagram or the website yep. or the menu, whereas my wife will look at the reviews. Ah. So she's not bothered about what it looks like. She's bothered yeah. about what other people say. Yeah. Whereas I want to see how it presents. That's interesting. Mm. Why do you think that is? Oh, I'm I'm a very visual person, mm. and uh, and and 
Yeah, I think my wife just likes to see what other people. One of the biggest letdowns in her life is is if we go out for dinner mm. and she can't find anything on the menu. Right, and it's yeah. It, see, I never it, it turns into a bad night. Is, it right? is, is she a picky eater or something? Or? Not a picky eater at all. She doesn't like to be disappointed. Right. Okay. Mm. Yeah. 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 So see, never that's why we have menu. no mirrors in our place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's come across very yeah. wrong. I never look at the menu way <laughs> because I always like a surprise, you know. And I love, I love reviews. I love reviews, but I always go down to the one star because I love oh. to see what people fucking whinge come about. Come on, isn't that the best? Yeah, it's the greatest. The bad review. <laughs> I mean, we don't need to hear about the good reviews. Yeah, I, I want to know what's wrong. Yeah, with I know. Yeah, yeah. Tell I want to know what's wrong with, with it. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what is great about reading bad reviews? It's a really good way of managing expectations. Yeah. Whenever I stay at like an Airbnb or something like that, yeah. I'll always read the bad reviews, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'll make I'll, I'll think to myself, oh, you know, it's probably going to be shit. Yeah. And the best thing about that is when you get there, it either meets your expectations and it mm. is shit, mm. or it's brilliant. Yeah. And you're like, what was that guy complaining about? Yeah, exactly. So you've just like manufactured a really good experience for yourself that's, by doing that. That's great. That's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I like. It's that. also why yeah. I I like to get press shots done of myself when I look a bit fatter. Mm. Because then when I turn up to an event, they're like, oh, he looks all right. I saw his photo, he actually looked yeah. like a fat piece of shit. Yeah. And now he's... Because the inverse of that is no good, Much right? better in person. Yeah, everyone's like, I'll get my press shots done. I'm going to lose some weight for the press. I'm like, don't do it. Yeah, no, because right. everyone is expecting this yeah, yeah, guy yeah, and then yeah. you turn up. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Mate, speaking of photos, there's one on your Instagram of you and a goat. Yes. What's the story there? I went down to a wedding uh, down the coast in Jarvis Bay. And uh, it was on this farm. It's a brilliant place, actually. Yeah. They could, you know, you got a wedding venue kind of thing. Uh, it's all, you know, there's accommodation mm. and there's all the things that you might expect. And then there's just a farm. It is a farm. Yeah. So there's like 30 goats. And Did you I ride saw, one? Huh? I didn't know. I don't think you can ride them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can it's ride them. It wasn't a fairground. No. I mean, I'm walking through like the goat enclosure. Because it was the first thing I, I got there. I saw a goat. And I'm like, I'm going to go see the fucking goats. Because yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> right? as as yeah, as soon as I got there. And I didn't. I think I didn't get to see them till the next day. Don't I? I went down to the goat enclosure. And, uh, you know, it's all muddy on the floor. Because mm. they're, they're not the cleanest animals. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah. If we're doing a goats watching, I apologize. Um, but... <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> they're dirty. And there's just mud and shit everywhere. But they're cute. It's yeah, cool. So yeah. I'm sort of walking really carefully because i got prosthetic legs. And if I slip on something yeah. and I end up in goat shit, yeah, yeah. that's not it's, coming it's off. It's not a good day. And it's a wedding. I'm, yeah. I'm well-dressed. Yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Put your best tux on everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was a great wedding, great goats. And yeah, uh, yeah it was a fun What a time. review. Yeah. How many that stars? Was that, was, that was a good I, review. Oh, I give that five stars. So it's not one you want to read before you go to a <laughs> yeah, wedding. Exactly. You want the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much shit. <laughs> Mate, you mentioned about um, walking prosthetic legs. You've obviously been one on one hell of a journey that I think, mm. I mean, there's no one in my in my sphere that I think can ever compare with that. Um, how did you start to kind of navigate? And we'll obviously get to, obviously, you becoming 19 and, and finding the, the disease and things, but I almost want to kind of work backwards, then work forwards again. Right. How Where did you start? Mm. Hey? Where did you want to start? I was going to say, I, I just wanted to kind of, Understand how you started to navigate walking again. Ah, yes. Um, and then we'll, you know, we can we can then work backwards in terms of the journey there, and then hey, we can get onto your keynotes and your podcast. And yeah, we've got a night, and we've got a full bottle of wine, so yeah, we've got plenty exactly. of time. Uh, so well, yeah, the, the walking thing for me was so you know for, for those who don't know me, which I assume is everyone, um, I had meningococcal, and so it, it, it's kind of, it gives you a blood poisoning septicemia, mm. and in order to stop that from spreading and knocking you off you need to start amputating limbs. And my legs were the first to go, but they're below the knee, which is good news. Because mm. if they're above the knee, it's a lot harder to walk. And I lost both arms as well. Um, but I started to learn how to walk first. And the, the biggest problem that I had with walking was that the meningococcal septicemia also affects your skin, which is why I've got all these scars and deviated septum and all this sort of stuff. And so I had scars to like 80% of my remaining body. Sorry, not scars, wounds at that time. They've become, yeah. become scars since then. And so it's completely counterproductive to try and walk on prosthetics when you have open wounds on your legs because the wounds just go backwards mm. in progress, you know? Yeah, yeah. But it's also important to try and start walking on prosthetics as soon as you can so as you don't get muscles atrophying and you can't weight bear on them. So it was this kind of balance... Mm of needing to try and get up on prosthetics and walk but not doing too much damage to my skin. And so I think it took me 
a much longer time to get up walking than it would a normal amputee. Mm. I don't remember exactly, but it was months, you know, maybe four to six months or something like that. Um, and, you know, th- when it starts off, I had, uh, you know, one person on each leg moving the leg for me. Mm. I had one person under each arm holding my weight. And then I had another person in front of me holding a walking frame that was in front of me. So you're talking about like five people on you trying to yeah. get you walking a few meters. Mm. And it's really hard because you don't see, you know, there's, there's no mental jump between that and just walking like a normal person. Mm. You know, you, ca- you can't see that that goal in the future. So you kind of need to just work towards small goals. Like I want to get rid of that person in front of me. Then I want to get rid of mm. this person on my right leg. Then that person. And then I want to get rid of this person. And then eventually, you know, you're walking with one person under one arm and then you can finally get rid of them. So you kind of have to, it's an iterative process and you, you need to be able to look at it through that lens as well. Mm. Otherwise, you just get completely demoralised, you know. Mm. And so with, with something like menin- meningococcal, is it, a sh- is it a sharp decline? Was it like an overnight thing where it, it, you, you became ill or was it a slow decline so you had this natural deterioration if i can put it that way because you've obviously got a natural progression moving up but was it a, a v-shape or yeah. it's it's pretty much like a stock market crash it's fucking right it, i mean it has Very a cool. yeah it, it's got an incubation period of seven to ten days but you really don't start feeling symptoms or at least i didn't until it's almost too late yeah. you know and, and are we talking something that's hereditary or are we talking no. something that's one in it's a, you know it's transmitted like covid Right, you can get it through saliva or s- sharing drinks with someone or something like that. Far out. So yeah, there are yeah. other people around you then that would have had meningococcal as well. You've yeah, that's right. You, that's were right. you ever able to get down to like patient zero or like no? Yeah, I wasn't. Um, and the doctors told me at the time that some people do carry it, but they're not susceptible to oh, it. Really? And so it can just be a thing where if, if you are susceptible to it, you happen to come into contact with somebody who yeah. is carrying it, and you know it's just bad luck. Yeah. Um, and there are there weren't too many instances of it, although the optics on it aren't good because it's such a devastating disease mm. that it did get a lot of media attention at the time, mm. and henceforth, you know, there was a vaccine developed pretty rapidly um, that came out a couple of years after I'd had it, um, and so there aren't as many instances these days, I believe, yeah. as there were back when I got it, um, but yeah, transmitted usually over saliva. Uh, incubation period of you know who cares and then one night you like i mean i went to uni one day and with the full intention of going to several lectures yeah. and i was at the you know the cafe at university of sydney before You're fine in the morning when you find the morning when i woke up and then get there and i'm feeling sort of just flu like you know just really run down yeah. kind of like what we're talking about with with covid of that mm. sort of you know uh, lethargy and you know a little bit flu like symptoms <clears throat> And I made the decision. Made the decision to go home. Uh, I was living in Balmain at the time, and yeah, just headed back home. And I thought I'll put myself to bed and just get over it. And uh, there was a rapid decline that day. So it was just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then I would wake up in the in the middle of the night with hot and cold sweats. You know, I wasn't completely lucid most of the time. I couldn't walk. I was crawling to the bathroom oh, to throw up and come back, and then. I feel really cold and shivering. So I, at one point I put myself in the shower with hot water on and then I must have passed out because I woke up in the shower yeah. and there was like blood on the tiles and there's water dripping down on me and I'm just like, what is going on? And so it wasn't until the next morning that I, I texted my stepsister and I was like, I think I might have to go to the doctor. Mm. <laughs> and she's like, all right, cheap. To her credit, was there in you know twenty minutes flat mm. to my apartment. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and then you know by the time she got there and saw me, I had the purple rash all over my face and my body, which was emblematic of meningococcal C septicemia. Not that she knew this, but she took one look at me and she was like, "You're going to hospital." Yeah, yeah. yeah that's not a doctor's trip. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, but I was like, "No, I think I would just go to a doctor." Yeah, be fine. Right, yeah. <laughs> because oh, I'm a 19 year old boy. You're like, yeah. "Fuck you, invincible." Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, she's just worrying, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she took me up to the hospital, which, which luckily was around the corner at Balmain yeah. Hospital from my house. Notwithstanding, they weren't equipped to deal with something like that, mm. but it was great as a sort of just point of entry. 
Um, I was talking to someone recently about this. It's strange, you know, you ever go into the emergency department and you walk in and they're just like, yeah, give me a name and address and everybody you've fucked and wait for three hours. <laughs> and like I walk in there and expecting that kind of shit, yeah. right? And this woman just looked at me and she's like, get that guy a wheelchair, get him into a room right now. And the nurses were ripping my clothes off and sticking needles in me and I'm just like, this human pin cushion. Far out. Yeah, it's crazy. What do you start rationalizing at that stage? You know, all yeah. of this shit's happening. It's like, man, I've, uh, you know, I'm just a little bit sick, and you yeah, like all of this bang, bang, and yeah, people yeah, take yeah. it full. Yeah, serious. it's like a Monty Python skit. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much. I had this this moment there where they told me they said we're going to transfer you to RPA because this is not our kind of deal. Mm. I was like, fair enough. And they put me in the back of this ambulance and they give you a guy, you know, paramedic, mm. whatever. I don't know what he was supposed to do. He's sit there with me. Maybe yeah. it was for company or something. Yeah, like. yeah. But I remember he was quite sort of stern. And whenever I meet someone like that, I always try to make them laugh. And uh, I was trying to make him laugh and he just, he wasn't having a bar of it. And then uh, I said to him at one point, I said, how long till we get there? And he said, oh, 10 minutes. And I remember saying, 10 minutes is what people say when they have no fucking idea how long it's going to take yeah. to get somewhere. Because if it's close, you say up. five. Yeah. If it's over yeah. 12, 30, yeah. you know, you'd yeah. be more specific. <laughs> 10, fuck you, 10 minutes. Yeah. Like, there's no yeah. 10 minutes, right? And that, and he uh, got a cracker smile out of yeah. him at that point. He had a bit of a giggle. Yeah. And I was like, yes. Got him. <laughs> that was the last thing I remember at all. Because when I got to RPA, they induced me into a coma for like two and a half weeks. So apparently oh, cool. I was lucid when I got there, but I don't remember it because often when they induce you to, into a coma, you forget a bit before that as well. Mm. Maybe it's something to do with trauma, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure. Or you tell bad jokes by something. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and your, your memory's like, mm -mm, yeah. Forget, yeah. yeah. Block that <laughs> shit out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Far out. So, um, yeah, that was it. And I was in a coma for a couple of weeks, maybe two and a half weeks or something like yeah. that. And then I had, I think I was in RPA in total for about six weeks. And then it was Concord Hospital for about four months. Mm. They did all my amputations. Yeah. Um, definitely recommend them for amputations. <laughs> they did a great job. Have you if given any of you guys are thinking about did it. Did you give them the review? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How, they, fantastic that, that would be review, quite the Google Concord review, Hospital. wouldn't it? Five stars. They are, yeah. They get five stars. Oh, They're man, really you good. should do that for Did you want to top up? Uh, yeah, please. Thanks. Um, and then, I've worn the worst shirt for red wine. You yeah, that's okay. Good. That's okay. Um, I'm kind of regretting it out of my glass now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, join us. Um, and then I spent a year after that <clears throat> in a in a hospital called Prince Henry, mm. which uh, which was out on the coast, Little Bay. It doesn't exist anymore. And when I went there, it was predominantly abandoned, save for two wards. And that was the spinal injury ward. That's where all the cool kids were, mm. right? Because they're, you know, bare max accidents and things like that. Or my ward, which was the rehab ward, and that was mainly geriatrics who lost legs yep. to diabetes and me. Mm. So it was really good motivation for me to get up and go down to the spinal ward and make friends with some yeah. guys in wheelchairs. You brought the demographic down. Yeah, brought, that's yeah. right. The yeah. average age. Yeah. I brought the average. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just wait, sorry. You were in a coma when they decided to chop? No. Okay. So that Coma was just a life support deal. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They right. just try to make you not die for yeah. a bit. Okay. And if they're successful at yeah. that, yeah. Um, then, you know, when I got out of the coma, mm. you know, they said, well, you know, we're going to have to take your legs. Otherwise, mm. you know, it's time's up. Um, and then well, I think it was maybe even a couple of weeks or a month later mm. that they said the same thing about my arms. And I was much, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I was much more reluctant to lose my arms than my legs because even though I didn't really know much about prosthetics or wheelchairs or anything like that, pretty sure people get along just fine without legs, right? Yeah. And y you do. You know, yeah. I mean, like a lot of people, you wouldn't believe how many amputees there are walking around like leg amputees because you wouldn't notice. If they wear jeans, you can walk pretty well. Yeah. Um, and live a pretty normal life, but... When I thought about losing my arms, apart from the just insanity of loss of independence and the not knowing of how I would cope or, you know, what I would do, I was also a musician as well. I mm. used to play guitar and that was, I mean, not 
professionally or anything, but it was a you know something that I loved doing. It was a creative outlet, mm. and so the idea that I wouldn't be able to do that anymore was a huge hit. So it's mm. like loss of independence and loss of creative outlet sure. and uncertainty plus pain Big just hit. sort of layered on yeah. top of itself. Yeah. Or, so when, or when you're kind of late teens, early 20s and, mm. you know, want and to give life a bit of a nudge as well. Yeah, it's not shit you should Absolutely, be thinking about. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so ha- so how, yeah, no, how did that... Sorry. No, no, it's fine. It's because we had flowers in here, that's what it is. Sorry. Yeah. Um, how did that fall with you? Like, how did you process that? How did you work your way through mm. that? Uh, again, that it, that in itself is an iterative process as well, and it's not something that's sort of a, a flag fall situation, I guess. Um, I did think long and hard about not getting my arms amputated because I remember I had a doctor, he's one of my plastic surgeons, I think he was a guy who did a lot of my amputations, uh, and he's a really funny guy, quite like him. He had a very weird, he's Austrian dude, and he had a very sort of strange way of posing things, and he said to me... Uh, when, when it was time for my arms to go, he came in and he said, well, you have two options. I said, okay. He said, uh, you can uh, have your arms amputated. People do live with prosthetic arms. It's not common, but you'll be able to do it. You'll be able to live a life, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, not too big on that option. Yeah, what else you got? And he said, well, you can keep them. And we, you know, like we'll just debride a bit and you can just keep them. And I said, okay, well, What's the catch? He's like, oh, you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> it's pretty funny when you think about it. Like, it's very clever. Yeah. And I was, but I realised that, yeah, he was being cheeky in a way, but he was also giving me a choice. Yeah. Because, you know, I was over 18. Yeah. Very make my choice. own decisions. Yeah. Um, and if I didn't want to continue like that, I could refuse the operation. So yeah, I was given a choice at that moment. It's like, do you do you lose them or you do you um, do you take them off and just let the chips fall where they may? Kind of you know, roll the dice. Mm. And uh, yeah, was that an instant decision? <clears throat> That's a good question. I I don't think I could give you an honest answer just because my memory of that time isn't absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I laboured over it too long after having that conversation with him. What about the process time after, you know, having your amputations? Like, is there a time where you have to come come to terms with it? Or is it yeah. just like, it's like, all right, this is the new... I don't want to yeah, say the, the new, new normal. normal. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. We're yeah. just going to have to live with it. Learn to live with <laughs> it. I think, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the process time. Um, did it happen instantly or like, obviously, no, I don't think it would, but... Yeah, Not really, tell us no. About it. <clears throat> but I, I, I found a huge correlation. I thought that was a USB stick in your fucking hand, Dave. Hey, that, there's a market there, isn't there? A vape slash USB stick. Especially when you charge them up. You do DJ sets with a vape. <laughs> and you can see me <laughs> sucking on the decks. <laughs> you heard it here first. We're gonna, the decks, yeah, not the... D- yeah, yeah, okay. We're going to... Yeah, we're going to pass an idea. Sucking on the duck. Sorry, that's a horrible Kiwi accent. Oh, actually. God. Yeah. What, a, what an inappropriate time for a joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what were we talking about that. again? Um, uh, oh, the yeah, process um, time. Yes, process time. Sorry, mm. yeah, back to the serious stuff. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, look, it, I found a, a, a really interesting correlation with, with me in terms of how I process things psychologically and how much physical pain I was in. Yeah. Because physical pain is one of those barriers to progress. Mm. And... Progress is what helps, well, at least me, with getting over it mentally, you know? Mm. So if I could see progress happening physically, um, then mentally I would get better. But the physical pain got in the way of that so much. Yeah, you couldn't um, move to the next yeah, step. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you're getting fucked from both sides. It yeah. was, yeah, it was pretty bad. So, yeah, it, it, it during the time and when I was in hospital, um, it was pretty emotionally challenging. Um, towards the end of it, when I started progressing and, and getting a lot better and regaining little bits of independence um, and little bits of hope come with that. And then I made a bunch of friends that were in the hospital and yeah. the spinal unit and I had a sort of a social existence with them. I mean, I always had my friends and family visiting me every day. They were unbelievable. Um, but I had a different, uh, you know, friendship with some of the spinal kids, on, you know, on the weekends mm-hmm. or at night, you know, you'd sit out on one of those nightingale wards and, 
guy would get a bottle of vodka or some beers or something and we'd often like take trips around um, the abandoned parts of the hospital because mm. th- this hospital that I was mentioning, right, is like 90% abandoned. Mm. looks like something out of – have you seen Shutter Island? Yeah. Mm. It, it like sounds Island. petrifying. Oh, yeah, it was terrifying, <laughs> yeah. And there are only those but two cool wards well. open. Yeah. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> interestingly, there were these stray cats that lived – uh, underneath the building, like underneath yeah. the buildings that we were in. And we used to feed the stray cat because, you know, mm. who else going to feed him? And we used to feed him the hospital food. Yeah. And they wouldn't fucking they wouldn't eat, eat it. it. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't eat it. I was like, we'd look at each other and we'd be like, whoa, that's yeah. not food. That's a review. That's t- <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. Come to Prince Henry <laughs> where the stray cats won't even eat the Swedish meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're not Swedish meatballs. No, no. We used to joke because the uh, Prince Henry was right up the road from Long Bay Jail. Mm. Not that I've ever been to Long Bay Jail, but I imagine being an inmate at Prince Henry was pretty similar. The only difference being they got better food than we did. <laughs> <laughs> they, I assume. I, don't know. <laughs> I yeah. like it. It's good. Do you use sound effects? No, no, no. I'm not going to press the wrong one. You can tell it's been a while. Oh, have you got sound, uh, sound effects on that? We yeah. have. Yeah, but, we, all, but we we always press the wrong one. So tend to make the jokes inappropriate or the comments <laughs> yeah, just, they yeah. don't make sense to yeah, the listener me. or the viewer yeah. that's me which um, which am- well was it easier to get used to the legs or the hands being gone um, getting used to the arms were easier only because you're forced to use them for so many mm. you know things that you have to do that you know you just naturally have to learn it's a sink or swim situation mm. I'm getting used to walking. Uh, at initially, was a painful process. So once the pain was gone, it was just fine. Mm. Yeah, okay. pretty much. Yeah. Harder to master the hands. A little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're more intricate, obviously, yeah, like yeah. In, in terms of how they're used. But you know, having two hooks is great. Yeah. Because if I had one, I would use it for nothing. Yeah, yeah. I would just use my good hand for everything. Yeah, yeah. But because I have two, I'm forced to use it, so I, I learn how to do things really quickly. Yeah. yeah. This might seem sound like a very naive, silly question. No, I love those. Um, why hooks? Did is there? Did you have a choice? Was was the? No, I usually the prosthet- have hands, but I, this is called lifestyle pirates. Yeah. So I thought I just. Man, I love just, it. Just dressed to the Mate. theme, and I appreciate <laughs> attention to detail. I love that. But was there an option for the? Because obviously the prosthetics have come a long way since they yeah. have been. Was yeah, there have, yeah. options back then, or have we only really just seen? <clears throat> there were options, yeah. So back when I got prosthetic arms, they had my electric hands. The parrots outside. He, he <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've always actually sorry. To, uh, I, I will get back to your question, yeah. but I always wanted to get a fancy dress wooden leg that I can put on. Brilliant. So just made out of my yeah. leg, but just have it with wood. Yeah. And then every time you know it's Halloween, sorted. <laughs> uh, where was I? Actually, we talked oh, about, yes. about hooks and, and the menu yeah, yeah. that was prosthetics. Oh, yeah, sorry, 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 yeah. So I, so I tried out my electric hands uh, when they came out. I didn't actually have one fitted, but they they used to um, give you these two electrodes that they'd put on your arm and they'd have a hand attached to a table and then you could kind of close the hand or open it. It's really cumbersome and shit yeah. and they're really heavy and... They try to look like hands. Who are you trying to fool? Yeah. Like it's not. They don't look like hands yeah. at all. You know, like it's ridiculous. But I think the thing that I didn't like about them the most was that they were heavy. Yeah. yeah. And because I don't have elbows, um, when I lift a, a hook like that, I usually just use momentum and yeah. swing it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just easier having something really lightweight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I started using the hooks, and I could just. The, the, the motor skills on them are just better. I can pick up a piece of cigarette ash off the table and not break oh, it. Yeah. I can pick up a piece of paper. They're, they're a lot more... Well, mate, you can pick up a glass of red wine. I can pick up... A, yeah, you could probably do that with one of those hands, mm. but, I mean, it's a bit clunky. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think... I hate things that are trying to make it look like the mm. thing that it's replacing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like if you're vegan... Like, oh, fuck. don't eat yeah. like a fake steak. Yeah, right? exactly. Just eat vegetables. Like it's fine to eat yeah. vegetables. There's nothing wrong with vegetables. Yeah, I Just know, eat right? the vegetables. Yeah, I've never understood it because I've, yeah. I've had friends that are vegan and, you know, cooked for them uh, before and tried to do stuff. And and I, I much prefer cooking vegan food for vegans when you don't make it 
mm. try to be mm. the thing that it isn't. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of what hooks are yeah. in a way. It's like if you could design from scratch something that would be yeah. um, more useful than a hand. I mean, the thing that you probably you run into is that the world around you is designed for hands, mm. right? And so what you're looking at is a lightweight, durable thing that can emulate what a hand does mm. in a lot of situations with a few added benefits, like I'm the first person to get something hot out of the oven, mm. right? <laughs> Or flip a steak on the barbecue. Shopping bags. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I can do shopping bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I actually find all that stuff really interesting. We've been talking a lot re recently about universal design, which is sort of the concept where uh, something will be innovated or, or, or designed with people of all abilities in mind, and not for selfish reasons. I don't want you know elevators in every fucking building. Mm. The, like <clears throat> the reason I find it interesting is because often people design for universal design and they stumble across things that benefit the wider population so a good example of this would be um, the replacement from circular doorknobs to door handles right which were originally invented for you know people with limited motor skills maybe elderly people uh, children exiting burning buildings and stuff like that drunks drunks yeah. sure yeah <laughs> but you know as a lot of people <coughs> pardon me as a lot of people came to understand it was also better um, for any able-bodied person opening with their elbow if they're holding a cup of lattes mm. when they're walking into a building, right? So there's so many iterations of things, of, of technologies and, and design that are designed for people uh, either with disabilities or limited motor skills or whatever it is that end up benefiting everyone. Mm. I think it was BT back in the 80s, the British, tele you mm. would know, British yep. Telecom. Yep. Who, um, it's good to talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, who in the 80s, came, I think it was the 80s, came out with a home phone with really large buttons, mm. yeah. you know, for people with small eyes. It became their best-selling phone. Yeah. Mm. It was just a hell of a lot better like, than the one that used to... Yeah. Uh, rotary phones. Yeah. That reminds <laughs> me of The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, where yeah. Homer's trying to dial and it's like the hand you... The finger you're using yeah. is too fat. <laughs> <laughs> to purchase a dialing one, mash the keypad with your palm. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if you think about it, right, it, it, like... Everybody is disabled at one point in their life, mm. right? So it's not – I don't think of disabilities – well, for me, it's like a constant, right, because I mm. am disabled. But, you know, if you're leaving uh, – if you're leaving coals with a couple of shopping bags, you've effectively lost the use of your hands, mm. right? Mm. Mm. So something that would help someone without hands is going to help you in that moment as well. So a lot of those universal design initiatives – um, can often just stumble upon really advantageous mm. uh, benefits to the group or the aggregate. Mm. And I find that really fascinating. So have you got into that recently or, or is mm. that is that something that you've you, you've kind of gone on straight away? Or is that just... No, it's journey? something that I, I, I just um, sort of stumbled upon a couple of years ago and yeah. then just started reading more and more about and I find it kind of fascinating. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, just been looking into it a lot more. It's great. It's great. So... Obviously, prosthetics limbs um, have come a long way. Um, you know, maybe I'm being naive as well, but, you know, you watch on, like, documentary channels and everything else like that, they do have these hands now that are completely yeah. motorised and stuff like that. How yeah, far is that? Yeah, yeah, is that, yeah, is that sci-fi or is that actually a thing now? Um, is look, it I think it testing? exists, yeah. right? I'm not sure how accessible it is, okay. ironic use of yeah, word, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hear stories about it all the time. Sometimes they're bad stories. Like they'll say, oh, they've developed it in Japan. They get some amputee over and they, they fly them out. You're so close every time. Fuck. Yeah. Fly them over. Just quietly, if, if Tom got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, like a <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> like, <laughs> Be like water. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the wrong reference. Anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, it was Bruce Lee. Yeah. Um, so it's it's usually a story I hear about you know uh, some Japanese company uh, has developed a fully articulating prosthetic hand. Um, someone will be asked to be the ambassador for it. They'll fly over, they'll use it, they'll take a video of it working, they'll put it on Facebook. Some asshole will see it and talk to me about it. Mm. But then the person doesn't get it. I mean, unless they cough up like half a million dollars mm. or something like that. So look, it's realistically speaking for a lot of people right now, a lot of amputees, it's probably in that tier of kind of like SpaceX, mm. you know? 
if, if you're wealthy enough or you get a sponsorship or something yeah. like that, you can do it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's not like I'm going to write to the NDIS and be, or maybe I can, I'm not sure. I don't yeah. really give a fuck because I like the hooks. But yeah. you know, at this point, <laughs> I, it's, it's not a technology that is good enough to be ubiquitous, I think. Yeah. 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 So, so going back to your hooks, I was listening to one of your um, podcasts. You mentioned your guitaring early on, that you love your guitaring. Yeah. And you actually, um, if I understood it correctly, you kind of redesigned the guitar or you basically were able to still play the guitar with, with your hooks. Yeah, um, that's right. Did that give you, was that a big thing for you headspace-wise that you, you had something back, you got something that you used to love? Yes, back? And And how did you manage to do it? It was a, a fantastic reclaiming of control in a way yeah um because i had made the decision when i was lying in my hospital bed in concord when i had my arms amputated that i was gonna work out a way to play the guitar again Mm. and i think i said it to a couple of people maybe my dad or something who would have been like yeah like whatever you know i mean he's very supportive but he would have been like yeah you you know that kind of um and i thought you i'm gonna do it like i'm gonna i can yeah. t- i can tell you don't believe me um and so i i sort of had to break down the problem of guitar playing to what it actually meant to me not what it meant to the guitar or meant what it meant to other people and what it meant to me was i liked writing music as a creative outlet i liked playing with friends so i realized that i didn't necessarily have to <clears throat> um you know play the guitar like frank zappa and and I probably was never going to be able to play the guitar like Frank Zappa with hands, mm. right? So let's just take oh, that off that. the table. Yeah, yeah I don't <laughs> know that. That's true. <laughs> but I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. So I thought I, I need a simplified way that I can still play a guitar, that I can still write and I can still play with friends. And so I went with, like, you know, I had maybe six or seven different designs that I'd worked on. And a lot of them were, I mean, not sure how much you know about guitar, but yeah, if you play what's called a bar chord or a power chord, it's the same finger formation that can move up each fret. And so I was working on something that, you know, could press down in that formation and then I could just sort of slide it up Mm. and pull it down to be able to play a a bar chord. And then I realised that the the frets would be incrementally closer together as you go up, so you can't really do that or you Mm. can only get away with the first five frets. So that didn't work, was back to the drawing board. And then I realized that you could just sort of look at the problem in reverse and rather than trying to make that formation, just tune all the strings so as if you just pressed all of them in one line, it played a chord. Mm. Okay. And then I realized that's kind of what slide players do. Yeah. And so I got, I, I developed a, uh, something that I could put my hooks into with a piece of steel that was attached to it. I, I, I got this done through an engineer, like mm. a guitar engineer kind of guy who I met through a friend and I just told him what my vision was. I'd drawn things up and I was like, this is what I need. And on my right hook, I need something that I can hold a guitar pick and I can also put my hooks in there and then click them to the side. And then I'll put the guitar on my lap. We'll, we'll raise the action of the strings. We'll put new strings on there new pickups, all this sort of stuff. And I'll play it like a slide. And it worked. As soon as he built it for me and gave it to me, I just put it right on my lap and I just started playing immediately. Because I already knew how to play the guitar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had the music theory behind me. It was just getting around the physicality of it. Mm, yeah. And the weird thing was, is uh, you know, apart from that moment where I felt that I had some kind of control or power back in my life, I also started to see other problems as less important than they were before. Mm-hmm. Once I'd gotten over that, mm. I was like, well, what hang up do I have about starting a band? or, you know, recording music or going and playing gigs. Nothing mm. now. I mean, that, that just seems like small potatoes. Mm. So I, I took guitar playing further than I did when I had hands yeah. after I had hooks. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Um, so that was great. Yeah. And I, I love the fact on the gig front, <clears throat> you did something very similar to me, obviously different different circumstances, but to, to be able to book yourself at your own gig – guaranteed you got a slot which is what i did when i first moved here that's it that's <laughs> so the way to do it i love the fact you did that that's the way to do it and then i think i overheard <laughs> you saying that you didn't have a clue how to play so you kind of like yeah. shit we've we've packed out a room we've got the venue how does this stuff work yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah and, and 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 my business partner chris also my closest friend um he had done a bit of 
DJing before me, but, but mm. kind of not really DJing like we DJ now, but kind of, you know, just playing songs mm. to people, yeah. not mixing and stuff really. But nonetheless, he, he kind of knew how to press play. Mm. Um, <laughs> and he told me, he's just like, because we, we do more than that. We, we do more than that. <laughs> yeah. mm. We do, we do. <laughs> um, he, uh, we started Starfuckers mm. and we had this opening night. We didn't really anticipate that many people coming. And this was at Club 77 yeah. that held like 200 and, well. I'm pretty sure I went there. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Did you just glaze over a little bit? Did you just kind of go, oh, the, oh, the memories? Oh, well, they're very blurred memories, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> I was trolleyed. I wouldn't be doing my job if they weren't, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so, you know, license for, I think, 180 or mm. something in this place, and we had like over 500 people. Yeah. It was Small sardines, yeah. right? And... I mean, we'd put me on the bill just, I think, after him or something. Mm. He kind of knew what he was doing. I didn't really know what I was doing. And, like, just got up there and he's, like, the green one. And I'm like, okay. I got this. Sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, look, I I have experience with mixes and everything because I did sound engineering. I I know how to use sound equipment. It wasn't just you just went up there, Q play, that's it. I didn't, I'd never used a CDJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but I knew where play was and how to skip to the next. I've had a CD player before in my life. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, I've used uh, yeah. CD players, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the set would have been awful. I mean, I don't remember it in yeah. particular, but no one gave a shit, yeah. right? Because the way that we'd framed that whole night was, it, we branded it. We were the hosts of it. Um, you you would come because you knew us. Uh, we would set the drinks and the door policy and the decorations and mm. all of that sort of stuff, and that's what people came to see. Not how well I could mix from one song yeah, to another. Yeah. Thank fuck they didn't come for that because <laughs> they would have been going home immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, th- I guess the unanticipated benefit of that was, you know, playing in a club every week to five hundred people, you learn pretty quickly. Oh yeah, you know, it's because baptism any, of fire. Shit. Any mistake is mm. immediately punished mm. by the audience. Yeah. <laughs> and how long did this night go for? Because a weekly night in Sydney, that's I mean that's a tall. It was different back that, then, man. Oh right, okay. So it was. Yeah, but uh, so you could do a weekly night. That was yeah, that was actually Thursday feasible. night delights in the cross. Right. Okay. Thursday night delight. Yeah. You did. No, no, no. Uh, it was like the no. It was a trance party. I used to go to uh. actually in Happy Hard. They used to, the flyer used to be Turkish delights, but it used to say Thursday night delights. That was seedy. I loved it. I hate the name. <laughs> you hate, hate it. I hate it. Yeah, it makes it work. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see the meeting they had, and yeah. one guy's like, "But it rhymes." Yeah, I know, right? That is everything in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> but innuendo and puns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, we 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 ran from two thousand six. We ran for over, I think, thirteen years. Wow, which is mm. a, a as far as I know, it the longest week weekly club night in Sydney. What what made you stop? Uh, well, we became old. <laughs> That's a big one. Time, yeah, time, time. and it just you know. Look, r- running a party every week is a little bit taxing. Big, yeah. Um, and, you know, being w- we had a lot we were up against towards the end. In 2014, you had the lockout laws. Mm. Yeah. The cross was decimated. We moved to Darling Harbour. You know, try and get anyone to Darling Harbour when they're not a French tourist. It's impossible, <laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, it was just a lot of work. And I think by the end of it, we were kind of like, once we get to a point that we're not loving it as much as we, like if it shows when the, when we're there, yeah. that we're not fully into it, let's just do the things that we know we're going to love. Because there's it's such a symbiotic relationship with the crowd. It's we, we, We're not, we've never been promoters in the traditional sense of kind of like, you know, we just book the DJs and do all the marketing and fucking, you know, mm. like, and then sit back and not talk to anyone. Like, we're in the crowd. Yeah. We know all the people that come. They're yeah. like family to us. And y- your vibe bounces off them and vice versa. And yeah. so you get to a point where you kind of just know, you're like, we need to do this in a capacity that we still enjoy it. Yeah. And so we scaled it back and just started doing maybe four or five events a year that were like our theme parties. So we do Mardi Gras, we do... Halloween and things like that. Yeah, cool. Um, and that's what we've been doing up until the point with COVID. Yeah, where we couldn't do it. So yeah. But did I see you on the? Um, you've got a gig this weekend, haven't you? Yes, we're um, we're playing um, Ministry of Sound. Which by the time Testament. we release this, Tom would have already spun. So yes. it's okay. <laughs> yes, I had a great gig. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the crowd? Ministry of Sound yeah. Testament. 
uh, yeah, no, we we played for it last year. They did an event. It was their thirtieth um, birthday or mm. something like that. Last year. Yeah, I think it was last year. <laughs> Crowds. Yeah, they had. I think it it conformed to mm. the one person per two square meter rule. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, it was down at Campbell's mm. Stores, which I'd never been to before. Actually, it was quite a nice venue, mm. and so there there's enough space in that place that you can sort of just cheekily eliminate a few rooms of people and everyone can be crowded into another and somehow it still conforms to the one person per two square meter rule mm. <laughs> whatever yeah, yeah. Um, but now they don't have it so i think it's uh it's going to be even busier this year and it's um and it's sold out pretty quickly yeah, yeah. so i think it's going to be a big weekend pumped mm. yeah i'm looking yeah. forward to it yeah, yeah i haven't dj in a while so yeah it'll be good yeah yeah so what's your what's your genre, style? Or? Uh, I I have no idea what my genre is. I mean, it's dance music. I yeah. always just say dance music. Yeah. yeah. Because first Alex of all, Alex K sort of donk. A <coughs> little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, we we play a little bit of everything, like yeah, from yeah. pop to dance to electro to, yeah, to yeah. tech house to so, like the odd techno track. Yeah. yeah. Like we're all over the place. Mm. Bit of like nineties mm. dance Fuck stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I I always hate um, you know trying to put a label on what what we do not because i can't but because those labels change so much yeah, yeah. that if someone watches this in a year they'll be like oh that's this thing it's yeah. totally not like you ever log into beatport and you think you know what a genre is oh man beatport's like, genres are fucking all over the yeah, shop yeah. house that, music has like, just yeah, got yeah, weird shit in it <laughs> but people's you know i have kid djs coming up to me they're like 18 and they're like oh, i play deep house and i'm like oh cool and then i watch their set and i'm like that's not fucking deep. Yeah. Like, well, not as I know it, you know? Yeah. Like, so it's... That's Gabba. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is Skrillex. You know? yeah. <laughs> Megatron having a wank. <laughs> Far out. Yeah. Um, so, mate, from, from one stage to another, you mm. have um, you have a beautiful TED Talk. Oh, thank um, you very much. Out Appreciate there it. called The Perks of Being a Pirate. Um, and how fortuitous that I would land myself on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Is that the only reason you're here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's googling. He's like, "What pirates can we actually?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're really running yeah. thin on this <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, John, Johnny Depp's busy yeah. at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, not anymore. No, not yeah. anymore. Yeah, he's got let off. Um, how did the, the TED talk come about? And we'll, we'll absolutely get into the to your talk in there. But how did that come about? How did you feel? Um, um, about yeah, it, it came about. Um, uh, well, I was just asked. By, right. by them through a mutual friend um, who so Eliza, um, it, who is a Paralympian, and she had meningococcal actually. Right, that's how I know her from you know many moons ago, and uh, you know she I think just texted me one day. We don't talk that often, but we you know still good friends. And she texted me and she said, uh, "Do you want to do a TED talk?" I said, "Okay." And she said, "Okay." <laughs> And then I L- just, LOL. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I think, yeah, she she was just like, yeah, I know this person from, uh, you know, like that's an ABC producer that's on with it, so she'll give you a call. And, yeah, they they just uh, asked me to, to put forward a couple of proposals of uh, talks that I'd like to do, and they would pick one. They said send two to three. And I thought, okay. I'm not going to send three because that's what they're expecting me to do. I'm going to send two and I'm going to send one that I don't want to do. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going to send one that I do want to do. And I'm going to make sure that the one that I do want to do looks a lot better. Brilliant. And I <laughs> I think they picked the one that I didn't want to do and they're like, that's brilliant. I was like, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> um, you understand me. Yeah. <laughs> so, So this one, the perks of being a pirate didn't, I think that was the one I didn't want to do. Right. So what was I the one you wanted I, I to do? I don't remember now. Right. It's weird because <laughs> it was like this three years ago. But because I, I wrote them pretty much just on the spot. Yeah. You know? And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. But I was like, oh, this would be a great TED talk, and that would be a great TED talk. Let's pick that one, and then I'll just throw. It, well, maybe this would, you know. And they're like, yeah, we want that. Mm. So I'm like, okay, fine. And uh, the the team there are just. Uh, Phenomenal, like really hard workers, really clever. Um, Fenella, who I worked with, and, and Winston Denyer, who w- works for the ABC, and Kirsty Degaris worked with me really closely. Well, and I was in Paris at the time, uh, and they were just emailing me back and forth and would do Zoom calls when mm. I needed help. And 
you know, it helped me take, uh, which, you know, I, I'd done a bit of speaking before, but typically if I do talks, I speak kind of extemporaneously and, and I don't really structure things mm. and I just run off at the mouth. Mm. <laughs> Seems to work for me. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's not like Ted style. Like you have to be really polished and slick. Yeah, yeah. And they really taught me how to like make something slick. Yeah, yeah. So they were fantastic. Um, and yeah, we just did that over correspondence while I was in France. Yeah, yeah. And then I flew back, I think a week before and just did it. And it was, yeah, it was a bit daunting. I'm not somebody who gets nervous public speaking ever. And I still don't think I was in that space, but it was definitely the most amount of people I've ever spoken to. It was, I think there was over five and a half thousand or something Wow. at the ICC. And it's, uh, it's really lucky that the lights are down low. Yeah. yeah I was going <laughs> to say kind of, the lights are really yeah, 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 yeah. You'd want them to be. Yeah. Um, but the production value of, I think TEDx Sydney is one of the, the biggest and most well-regarded TEDx's mm. um, in the world. And they boy, do they do a good job of it like mm. with their production and everything. Mm. So you mentioned in your TED Talk, actually, um, that, you've, well, that you've been taught or exposed to what you call is uh, the triviality of our own self-importance and self-consciousness. Yeah. Can you, expl- can you expand on that? What the fuck was I talking uh, about? <laughs> yeah, this is the one he didn't want to do, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why I was, go- I, to be honest, I was actually going to ask, do you remember saying this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this like gotcha journalism? Yeah. Uh, John no, Topper? On, yeah, I'd love one. Um, yes, yeah, that's right. Because it, you kind of, uh, let me think about how I'd put this. You kind of realise, you know, everybody says, you know, I realise how precious life is and how quickly it can be taken away. And yes, you know, you, you do realise that. Um, but you kind of also realise how little you matter in the grand scheme of things. It, you know, we are literally just floating on a rock. We're like a virus floating on a rock. Yeah. And millions of us die every day. And it doesn't really matter. And I think the reason it's important to keep that in the back of your mind at least is because quite often self-consciousness gets in the way of you doing what you want to do. And if you really put things in perspective like that and how little time you've got left and you sort of combine those two ideas or at least, you know, cross them over each other, I think people would feel a lot more confident in just getting done what they really want to do or being being less self-conscious about things like that. And I I just kind of found that at the same time I had that uh, realisation of, Get it? Got it? No, I didn't. It was just—he's just syncing just the audio. That was nothing to do with. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine like a mum yeah. driving? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to edit that out, <laughs> yeah. which means that this conversation makes no sense. Um, yeah. So I guess uh, yeah. At the same time that I that I had that moment of realization of, of you know don't waste time doing something that you don't really care about the same realisation of how insignificant you are mm. is becomes quite poignant as well. Mm. And, you know, just take opportunities as they come, do what you're going to do. Nobody cares about your life as much as you do. Nobody cares about your life as much as you do. You may think that they do. Mm. And it's to some extent we're all sort of, I guess, victims of impact bias in that way. But in reality... You know, every decision that you make in your life, if you believe that you do, which as a side note, I don't necessarily, but um, every decision has a butterfly effect. And if you take opportunities as they come, if you are less self-conscious moving forward and just try things out and be humble and be curious, I think people will be better for that. What's impact bias? What do you mean by that? Impact bias is the, the tendency to sort of... Uh, over anticipate the effects of things that will happen in your life you know I mean, so i mean if you're changing jobs or, or you're thinking about quitting or something like that there's a lot of anxiety that people have and they think that it's going to be worse you know it often comes from things like we fear the unexpected or, or mm. we fear unknowing mm-hmm. um, and so we tend to you know over exaggerate the impact things will have on yeah. our lives and once we get over them we're kind of like, oh, it wasn't really that bad. Yeah. And that's kind of like what's happened to me as well. And I and I get it from people all the time. They're kind of like, I never would have been able to go through what you did. And my only reply could be, well, how do you know that? Mm. Because I probably would have thought the same thing. Mm. But here I am 
and I'm absolutely fine. Mm. So you probably could too, to be honest. Mm. And yeah, impact bias is just, I think, probably an error that we all make way too mm. much. You know? So you mentioned that, uh, you know, this incident or change in your life has made you sort of a positive problem solving and pragmatic sort of person. Mm. <sighs> I you wouldn't say positive. No? No, I wouldn't say positive. No, no, no. I'm very cynical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Um, so you, let's see, eliminate that problem solving and pragmatic. <laughs> yeah, then. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, has that sort of been something that you've felt that you needed to be, or something that's just sort of happened naturally, and then? Yeah, you know? absolutely, something that's happened naturally. Mm. Um, just because I'd been put in a situation where I was forced to solve problems differently, mm. um, not something that I was anticipating. Yeah, we talked before about how I'd, I'd worked out that the world around me wasn't designed yeah. for someone with hooks. And so you need to think differently to solve problems all the time. You know, the analogy that I use in my TED Talk is about when I first started learning how to walk up steps and I would do it the way I always knew how, which is actually something called path dependency. It's, it's something that people do all the time. It's the way it's always been done, mm. right? And it leads to stagnation most of the time. And I realized that I couldn't walk up a step front like from front on just yet. And so I, I had to work out a different way to do it and that's why I turned to my side and I could get up immediately. Mm. So it wasn't the persistence of doing it. It's like, you know, there's people that, uh, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, which is yeah. the biggest load of shit I've ever heard in my life, right? <laughs> if at first you don't succeed, just work out a different way to yeah, do it, right? You're not an idiot. Yeah, yeah. So, and it w but it was that moment that dawned on me where I was like, I'm going to have to learn to do everything differently from the way I had yeah. before. And as soon as I looked at it through that lens, I was like, okay, every time I have a problem, whether it be physically, I, I'm going to have to rethink. Maybe I have to break down the problem. Maybe I have to work backwards. Maybe it, maybe it has to be an iterative problem-solving experience. Mm. Whatever it is, I have to do it differently. And then I would map that on to things I would do vocationally or in my personal life or whatever it was. And I just ended up becoming a good problem-solver um, by default, mm. I guess. And I noticed something really interesting because I've been – um, doing you know, speaking to businesses a lot over the past few years. And I feel like a lot of companies have gone through exactly what I've gone through with COVID, right? Because for once, they're forced to think differently about how to solve problems. If you had to work distributed or if, you, you know, if you're a restaurant and you have to become a dark kitchen or, you know, like, there's so many problems that were solved, so many innovations that were accelerated by COVID because the world for the first time in history, you know, everybody had the same problem and we had to work out different ways to do things. So drawing that analogy with companies these days, I think is something that resonates with them. And it's something that I think if you take from that message that you don't really need a pandemic to do that, hmm. you can just take risks and taking risks is, is very important because uh, let's take for instance, um, you know, work from home or whatever it was. Maybe you need video conferencing for that or whatever it was. How long has video conferencing been around yeah, for? Yeah, ages. Fucking ages, right? Why don't people use it? Why didn't they use it before COVID? I'll let you in on why. Mm. Because the first guy in a board meeting who said, let's have everyone work from home and just c dial in through video, if that didn't work out, would have been canned, mm. right? So the first person to you know try to make some sort of change that's – radical pays a disproportionate price if that doesn't pay off yeah, yeah. you know and so it's a you know nobody wants to put the bell on the cat right at the end of the day and so it take it you know it, it would have happened eventually probably would have taken you know another five or ten years or something like that mm. but covid just kind of put it in a pressure cooker mm. you know mm. and just it really drove like a different approach to work and innovation and stuff like that and i and i feel like that's what happened to me i, I was forced to look at things differently and make changes and the world is kind of going through that now. Yeah. That's a really good way to look at it. That's a really good way to look at it. There's two fucking flaws in here. Yeah. Just I it's got the other one. That's all good. I thought he said there's two flaws in here. Is <laughs> in my argument. I'm like, go no, for no, it. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, I'm <laughs> ready. No, no I, I, I totally agree with everything you said and it's very true, eh? You know, we've had to pivot. I hate that word. Um, <laughs> everyone's had to sort of pivot, you know, when, when yeah. the shit hit the fan. Mm. Um, yeah, but some of it's good, you know, like 
Yeah. You do have to make those changes, right? Some of the changes are fantastic. You'll keep with it. You'll keep them. Some of them are shit. Mm. But you were allowed to try mm. for the first time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just like so so many people were just fucking complacent for so long. You know? It's yeah. like, oh shit, now it's not working, you've got to do something. It's like mm. finally people are actually starting to use their brains. Yeah, that's you right. You know, and yeah. try and think outside the box. It's Another thing that I find interesting is that because the pandemic's lasted so long, mm. let's call it two it's years the or new norm, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Because it's lasted so long, I think it's going to be really hard to get people back to doing yeah. what they were before. Because if this was like a two week or a month thing, then you would, it would be like, okay, You've resume, about resume yeah. how you were before. Yeah. Now that it's been two years and people have worked out, a lot of them, you know, might work better over video conference. I mean, there's all uh, sorts of advantages that have come from, you know, video conferencing becoming normalized in the sense that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, businesses that I speak to and even in my, my own work, I've noticed that you, you open up the market for different clients mm. that you wouldn't have had access to before because maybe they live on the other side of the world, mm. but they've got too small a budget to fly to you or, or you've got too small a budget to fly to them or something like that. So normally you wouldn't do business with them. Like I, I've talked at conferences in the United States to you know a hundred people that wouldn't have had the budget to fly me over there, but because we're doing everyone's doing it over Zoom, mm. they've got the budget for it. Right? No one's really looking at the opportunities that have opened up. I mean, humans are pretty bad at judging opportunity cost at the best of time, mm. um, but nobody's really like pointing to that and saying, "Well, yeah, we've now got a whole bunch of advantages that we didn't have before because we're allowed to try that out." You know. Mm. You um. You, you talk about a few other things in your talks, and I don't want to. I don't want to take away all the content. Like I want people to to, to yeah, listen. Take, and yeah, my content's but, not worth shit. You can but, take. Um, <laughs> well, well, there's there's just a few things, um, and actually one of them I I, fa- I found quite interesting because it was one of my mantras I lived by, which was everything happens for a reason. Mm. But you say nothing happens for a reason. Yeah, that's right. Um, walk me through that. Uh, okay. Well, everything happens for a reason. Would assume. Uh, that there is some sort of omnipotent ruler, mm-hmm. right? That is the architect of what we're doing. At which point you would say, okay, really poor design. Also quite a capricious individual who doesn't give a fuck about a lot of us, right? Mm-hmm. Because we have good luck and bad luck and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that to be true. I think the idea that nothing happens for a reason is a little bit more useful in the same way that that the insignificance of our life is useful, although it sounds a little bit negative. Um, the onus is upon you to put the meaning in things. Mm. Uh, and I find that more useful because it's a skill that you can create, that you can hone in your life. If you're able to use kind of framing techniques to be able to look at negative vicissitudes in your life and say, well, what can I learn from this? Like mm. what what kind of meaning can I imbue upon this thing such that I don't make the same mistakes again, that I become a better person, that I learn from errors, that I do X, Y, Z. Um, then you don't need to rely on uh, God mm. um, to sort of dictate the trajectory of your life. It's, it's, it's up to you. Mm. And I think that gives you more opportunities. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. And I only say that because I was watching Jimmy Carr and Ricky Gervais at the weekend oh, yeah. on their new Netflix specials. Oh, did you specials. watch the new special? Yeah. yeah, it was good. How good? Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> I haven't seen yeah. it yet. Like, it's so good. I'm not going to nick anything. We'll talk about it after, but some, yeah. some of the stuff's good. But they're obviously both been through their journey as well, and they just mm. have totally washed their hands with, with, with faith and things like that as well. Um, talk to me about the Casino of Happiness. The Casino of Happiness. Is this shit you just make um, up? Like, yeah, don't, I... Like, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, are these and, hashtags? And, and not even like these. Like in the moment, I'll be like, oh, "Fuck it, I write a are these, like your, are these your articles that you want to do TED talks on? Uh, no, I, I do. I do talks on things like like happiness, yeah. uh, science of happiness, and things like that, and um, a little bit about luck. And uh, I spend most of my time, you know, just researching things like this that, that, that pertain to my situation, I guess. Um, and I became really interested in the idea of happiness a couple of years ago because it was something that was very difficult or ambiguous to measure. And I always, always had people saying to me like, oh, you know, with everything that you've been through, you seem like a really happy guy. And I never really thought about it much up until that point. Mm. Like I am, I guess. Mm. 
I mean, I don't really know what that meant. So I started asking myself questions and I'm like, well, what does it mean to be happy? Is it, you know, like, is it just a positive emotion that you feel in the moment or is it being happy with your life up to a point? And, and so I started looking into it and just interviewing some people and things like that. One of which is Tim Sharp. If you ever get the chance to interview him, he's a fascinating guy. Um, psychologist, sorry. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, so I started um, researching happiness uh, quite a lot. And the more I dug into it, uh, you know, the more of an onion that it was. Mm. It was a completely uh, you know, strange realm of psychology, how we delineate between uh, who's happy, who's not, how you rate happiness, whether it's heritable, like whether you can be born happy or not. Um, there's another thing called set point theory, which is um, that the theory that we are we are born with a set point of happiness in our life. Let's say you'd be a seven or you'd yeah. be a nine or whatever it is. And essentially you just vary between, you might go down to an eight or up to a 10 or whatever yeah. it is. But eventually you get back to, to nine, all other things being equal. And they did, there was a... Um, there's a paper that came out about um, studying people who had won the lottery mm. and people who had become recently disabled mm. and they would have their own set point of happiness and they would say, you know, like obviously when person B became disabled, he dipped a lot in happiness and person A um, won the lottery and she became, you know, three points happier than normal. Mm. And after six to 12 months, they all return back to their set points regardless of what had happened to them, mm. wow. which I think is kind of fascinating because mm. it, it, it almost indicates that your level of happiness is, is an immutable characteristic. Mm -hmm. That means something's happening for a reason. No, not necessarily. No? Well, what, what's the reason? No, that's about as far as that <laughs> conversation was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wasn't could expecting be, I mean, a rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Have we met? Um, <laughs> which means that it, you know it could be as you know uh, it could be as immutable as your hair color or something mm. like that. Um, and you know, most the general consensus among psychologists is that it's a range. Mm. You know, oh yeah, uh, that people experience. And people so call, everyone has sort of a range of happiness, and they sort of yeah oscill yeah oscillate. yeah they oscillate exactly mm. up and down. And you know, the trick is to use particular techniques to just stay at the top of your range as much as you can. Bananas. Bananas? Yeah, serotonin. <laughs> oh, dude, you must take so many drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not ever. So social connections. <laughs> Sorry, mum. <laughs> uh, social connections being other-oriented and bananas. Those are the three. <laughs> it's a science, baby. It's That's science. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So were you always this? Because you also have a wicked sense of humour, mm. which I, I which I appreciate. Being a pom, like yeah. we've all got pretty dark sense of humour as as mm. poms. Um, were you always like? Were you always like this? Were you always? I mean, you, you I get the sense that you read a lot. You're very um, studious. Is that even a word? You like Don't ask me, bro. I'm a mechanic. I wouldn't say I'm studious. <laughs> no. I do read a lot, and, yeah, I'm, yeah, in, yeah. and I'm in real estate. So what does that say? <laughs> 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 but, but were you always that way, or is this, or is this, I guess? Um, a kind of a, a natural progression through, I guess, curiosity around what's happened. And yeah, I, I've always been an extremely curious person, uh, but I'm also a very fickle person mm. in my interests, so they change all the time. Yeah. Um, so I'll develop different hobbies. I'll learn as much as I think is necessary about yeah. that thing. Yeah. And then I'll move on to something else. And I think it's because... It's not that I get bored with things, but if, if I were to plan out my life and say I'd rather know 40% about a thousand things mm. than a hundred percent about, you know, 40 things, yeah. I would pick the former. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, because I think, you know, so many different disciplines inform other disciplines mm. and you get like a wider um, life education mm. by just, you know, looking into different um, discourses, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So uh, this actually might be a nice lead on to some okay. some of the other hats you wear because you obviously you you do a podcast, uh, um, kind of not really, kind of yeah. What's it, what's this Coachella thing I'm seeing the un the unofficial podcast Coachella? No, no. Okay, no. I'll have to check I mean, out iTunes and the and the life examined. Good one, mate. 
The Life Examined was a series of interviews that I did over the past couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I'd been developing some online content that goes with my uh, speaking engagements. Mm, yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of the time I needed interviews with some professionals and industry leaders that would supplement that. And it's part of those types of things. And then also, um, you know, while you're setting up a studio and getting cameras and lights, get some interesting people in there just to have conversations. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it was an extension of my curiosity, let's yeah. say. Yeah. 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 Very cool. And so, so now keynote speaking is full-time gig. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I still do DJing from time to time, yeah. but um, yeah, it's becoming a full-time gig these days. Yeah. yeah. What's been your um your favorite gig so far? Your favorite? I really like small crowds. Mm. Me too. When I was yeah. DJing, I love small crowds. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Do you have any bass to compare? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love um speaking with small groups of people. I had a great gig a couple of years ago. Um, this guy called Andy Hoyne, who runs a commercial a, a company called Hoyne. Um, they're a design company. And he's become a, f- a fantastic friend since talking to his company. I think there were maybe 30 people in a, in a boardroom on a Friday night. And he, he just runs such an amazing office. Obviously, it looks beautiful and everything, but it's a very social environment. It's definitely like the future of work or how I see it. Mm. And every Friday he tends to like, you know, order a bunch of pizzas and, and opens really nice bottles of wine. Everyone just sits around, gets pissed and talks to each other. We and are like, free for that one. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, uh, he's God. come over and, you know, talked to, you know, my company. And it was just, it was such a just nice exchange, really great people. All the people that worked there were lovely. You know, people could shout out, you know, jokes from the crowd and you could sledge them or yeah. whatever it was. And it was just... Uh, I like gigs like that mm. more than I like uh, really big rooms of, you know, people that work in like high finance or stuff like that, yeah. mm. which can be challenging. Um, although, you know, whenever you deal with the events companies in between, they're always really lovely people. You just don't know what you're going to get when you arrive at the place. The room, yeah. And I found something weird recently that sometimes speaking at the most boring conferences is the best mm. because I, I try not to be a boring speaker. And so often, you know, I'm, I'm just the relief that they put in the middle, right? I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about. Like, I'm the guy that they get in just like, you know, for half an hour just to kind of make everyone laugh and maybe think a little bit differently about something, which is great for me. That's exactly where I sit, right? Yeah. So if they've spent their whole day listening to a bunch of economists, mm. I look pretty fucking funny. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a lineup of people that are funnier than me, then I look like a dickhead. You know? yeah. Like, so, yeah. Yeah okay. And what's been um, what's been the worst one, the worst speaking gig? Yeah. Um, any like a lot of the things that were on Zoom during the pandemic, mm. um, and you know through through no fault of the people who are watching, but they you know they didn't really nail uh, live conferencing as much as they should have. Mm. So you do a, like a a live conference that might have 400 people watching at home and all you see is a bunch of black screens. Yeah. There's absolutely no feedback when you're talking. Yeah. You know, you, you don't even know if people can hear you. Um, there might be a tech guy in, in your ear or something like that. So there's no back and forth. Yeah. You know, it's just like you're sort of presenting a monologue. Mm. There's no feeling to it. Yeah. yeah. That was something that um, when I was doing Zoom meetings or networking events or even team meetings that was a non-negotiable you had your screen on and you were engaged right um especially if we had someone external coming in to talk mm. or present or things because one it kept the pe- people engaged but two just from a general courtesy sure point yeah of view, absolutely you know like if someone's gone to the effort of putting a presentation together yeah give the give the the presenter or the the speaker your 10, 15, half an hour, what have you, right? Just Yeah, yeah. Like but, I mean, I also understand it from, from the perspective of the people who are forced to watch these fucking things. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, quite often they're total shit and they have to sit there all day pretending they care about stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's a balance. But, but I think I'd pick up on that and say that even if they had their screens on, yeah. y- you still kind of lack that 
personal feedback. Oh, yeah. And, and I always have like, I mean, my setup at home is I've got a camera with um, a teleprompter that flashes up and acts as a video screen. Yeah. So when I'm, you know, I, I put someone's face on it so I can look directly at them, but I'm looking at the camera to, to try and connect that, you know, eye, eye, eye contact kind yeah. of thing. Mm. And if you do a conference with 400 people, it doesn't matter whether their faces are on the screen. You put that thing up on the teleprompter, it was like tiny little pixels of like 400 people. There's no feedback you're getting whatsoever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think the technology itself at present doesn't allow for the kind of dynamic that a live event provides. Yeah. And I'm not saying it won't come, but it's not here yet. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I always struggle to sort of engage with, uh, with those things. Not that I do keynote speaking, but I'm usually the other guy in the on the other side of the camera mm. thinking why the fuck am I listening to this well, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah sometimes because I really struggle to engage unless I'm you know doing it in real life mm. yeah on behind a camera I just yeah I just can't do it I absolutely well, fucking hate it you're very ta- yeah, you're very tactile as a, yeah, as yeah, a day to day so yeah. Mate, I talk with my hands as well you know. well being Italian bop, yeah, bop, you talk yeah. with everything yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh body <laughs> Yeah, I've got lots of non-verbals. <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts in Italy is your family from? Uh, for, from the north, so um, near Luca, so a place called Valli yeah. and Venezia. So. And Venezia, yeah. Right. yeah, cool. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely. Have you done Italy? You I have. I've, on, I've only done um, Venice, Florence, Rome mm. and Milan, mm. which I didn't particularly so like. So only above the knee. Yeah, mm. pretty much. And mm. I'm really keen to go to Naples and uh, Sardinia. Yeah, Napoli is uh, beautiful. You yeah, know, because you got the Amalfi Coast, Positano, and everything like that. It's yeah, I mean, I only Queensland. travel for food. Yeah, so I just want the pizza. So oh, well, down, yeah, well, Napoli, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the best pizza. And I want to go to Bologna as yeah. well. Yeah, to have Bolognese. Well, to have everything. Apparently, it's, it's the food basket of mm, Italy. Yeah, so or Reg, it's part of um, Emilia Romagna. So that's pro- that's Italy's kitchen. Yeah, but out of all of those places, I'd probably not go to Bologna. Bologna is like oh, really? a university city. So oh. it's. Yeah, unless the uni's on, it's a dead, dead town. Well, I'm um, not going there to party. Yeah, I know, but you miss the vibe. You right. know, you can go to other places that have much more vibe and much more food. So I, here's what I like when I travel. Right, I want to go to a smaller city, not like a major city. I want a little bit of activity, but not a hell of a lot. If I go to a restaurant, I want to be able to get a table outside on the terrace. Yeah, really good food, really good wine. That's it. Um, and. A little bit of great architecture, which fuck it everywhere, but yeah. Yeah, so probably the most um, versatile region in Italy is probably Tuscany. So um, yeah. maybe go to you know San Gimignano, Pienza, mm. places like that. Um, they sort you of you need a car, right? That's what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, see, I've only ever been over there and taken the train mm. between major no, cities. Definitely got to get. But a I car. think get a car. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the freedom of just being able to just jump in a car is like, you know what, well, let's go here, let's go there. What's that? Let's let's yeah. figure it out. Let's find out. Yeah, it's the best. I, I, I really want to go to Campania just to have the buffalo mozzarella. Yeah, yeah. I need to go to Napoli to have, you know, good pizza. Yeah. Try it, try it out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll always go back to Rome just to have, you know, their cacio e pepe and yeah, yeah. amaciano. Like, those are my favorite kinds of passes. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Venice... Uh, is just such a magical city. I've, yeah, I've never had like I've, I've had some great food there, but it, it's never been. No, uh, so yeah. Venezia, you you got to know where to go. So Venezia is famous for what they call chichetti. Chichetti, yeah. Don't, don't even tell me about chichetti. Oh, right? man, I wanted to open up a chichetti bar. So did I. In Sydney. Did so you did really? Hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I Dude. wanted to own a ch- uh, chichetti and a, uh, like a wine bar. Can I tell you yeah. why a wine slash chichetti bar would be good in Sydney? As a preamble to mm. wherever, so it would work in places like Newtown, probably yeah. Double Bay, wherever yeah. it was. Yeah. You don't need to employ a chef. Yeah, exactly. You can have, yeah, you can have one person, maybe two, working there. You make most of your money off the wine, right? And because it's Sydney, you can charge like a bastard for a chicchetti. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. People, you get big turnover. Yeah, because the idea is they spend an hour here, then they go to dinner. You get yeah. a rush around six o'clock, maybe something like that. Yeah, yeah. If you add a dessert thing to that at mm. the end and you have a license to 2 a.m., maybe Afogati, something yeah. like that, cleared up. Yeah, that's it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or the other, the other way to do it would be um, Pinchos, right? Like, Have you been to San Sebastian? Mm. So so they do their own version of Chiquetti, yeah. which is called Pinchos. Okay. It's a little bit broader than Chiquetti. Like, mm. you know, Chiquetti, you get the bacala, you mm. get like X, Y, Z. Mm. There's about five or six that are the big hits. Yeah, of course. Right? 
uh, Pinchos is a lot more diverse. Okay. And you can get some really different types of Pinchos. Yeah, yeah. A few people are starting to do it now. The guys who run, um, actually f- old friends of mine uh, that run Bodega and Portenio. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're ripe to do it, man. Like those guys, I mean, Elvis is uh, Argentinian, mm. I believe. And uh, they they just kill anything that's sort of South American, mm. Spanish kind of stuff. Have you ever been to Porteño? No. Oh, yeah, I have in um, in Milan. I went. No, no, no. In Sydney. No, I haven't been here. to the one in Sydney. Go, go to it. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Another great restaurant to try if you're here in, in Sydney is Nour, N-O-U-R. Have you yeah. ever been there? No. Middle Eastern food. Okay. Probably... I'd, I'd have to say one of my top three favorite restaurants yeah. in this city. See, Middle Eastern food always gets me. It's just dips. No, no, no. <laughs> this, this shit will blow your mind. Yeah. This, is, this is one of the best yeah. restaurants. I, I, uh, you know, it's that kind of price point where you can get out of there spending between 50 to $80 a head mm. and eat really well. So if you go for a nice dinner with some, like four people or something. Thank you, Booze. Uh, yes. Do they play the Lebanese that, drums? Yeah, does, yeah, That's yeah. a personal. Do they play the Lebanese oh. drums? They do not. Oh, thank God! It's not that kind All right, of place. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> mate, they only know one fucking song. Dung dung dunga dung dung dunga dung. That's it. The whole night. You That's ever been it? to a Lebanese wedding? The whole fucking the whole night. They just play the same song. It's like, oh, we've got so much culture. Oh, fucking oh. make track too. I've been to a Lebanese. Well, I've been to a Lebanese Italian hybrid wedding. Uh, it's quite, it was quite well done. Seven. I mean, there's a lot people. of you know glass clinking and people on chairs. How many people? I was like Three thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so sure. similar to the Melbourne Grand Prix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> now I'm going to open up bar the Chiquetti bar. I was going to say, what yeah. the hell is Chiquetti? Also wanted to have them. Um, oh, sorry, we didn't even. So like, yeah, you get like little pieces of bread, and they have like toppings on them. Like it's just a little, pretty much a, a mouthful. You know, oh, okay. and then you have like bacala, you have um, hachuge, like all different types of things. You have prosciutto, like all, yeah, just little sort of appetizer things. And you, yeah, imagine yeah. like tapas, yeah. yeah, but it all comes on little bit pieces of bread, mm. lovely. And you just sort of buy, you know, you might go, I'll have one of those, one of those, one. It mm. might be three or four bucks each. Excellent. So you get like twelve dollars yeah. worth on a plate, and you guys share it, have a glass of wine. Mm. They do it in Italy for breakfast mm. or kind of brunch. But mm. I, th- I don't think Australians would do that. But they'd mm. have it pre dinner for sure. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Any any chance to have an, like an additional drinking service yep. in Australia will work. That's exactly you know? right. And <laughs> also anything that accommodates people who are not punctual. Mm. Exactly. Know, which so I think is great yeah. for you know we're waiting for Bob for our seven thirty reservation. Mm. The bastards late again. Yeah, Let's exactly. Go and get Let's some go have the get the yeah for sure. <laughs> and I also, also wanted to have like a little decks open decks in the corner. You know, so yep. you can just go in and play your deep house Skrillex. You know. <laughs> Chiquetti House. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, mate, it's coming. Chiquetti House. It'll you be on it next yeah. week. <laughs> this is New deep house. Sub so genre. House. Man, these sub genres <laughs> are getting out of control. <laughs> yeah, I'm done, John. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mate. I, I think we, we, we're going to wrap up. What am I asking a question though? Um, yeah. Legacy. Mm. Have you ever thought about? Yeah, you know, one thing I've been kind of just absorbing and and listening and reading about you, like. There's, again, you're very studious, you've got massive personality, your fingers in different pies, whether it's kind of looking at the way things are designed, keynote speaking, there's there's something going on there. Is mm. that because you want to be that implementer of change? Is that because you want to leave a legacy? What, what what does that mean for you? No, neither of those things. Right. Um, uh, I, I only act as <laughs> impulsively as I want to every day and I yeah. just let the chips fall where they may. Legacy is a very interesting topic. Uh, it, you know, it's one of those things that's a great juxtaposition because it's kind of like, to an extent, everybody works towards and lives towards having some sort of legacy, mm. whether it be, uh, you know, uh, people will remember me for X, Y, Z or just having children that, you know, the memory carries, you know. But it also doesn't make a lot of sense because you will effectively be gone. Mm. And so you don't retrospectively experience that legacy. And it also doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Um, so the fact that we're, we're quite motivated by that a lot of the time is, is fascinating. Certainly nothing that I do vocationally is um, motivated by any form of legacy whatsoever. Mm. No. Yeah, okay. Mm. Right. It has been an absolute pleasure. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's Thanks. cheers an empty glass. Abs- well, I feel embarrassed by doing that. But I'm embarrassed for it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Salute. No, I was only for the sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> um, for real. Thank Mal- you so much for the invitation today. It's been great hanging out with you guys. You're an amazing conversation. I want to come back soon. I'll be awesome. looking forward to it. Thank yeah. you very forward much. To it. Thanks a lot.